at what other people are doing with Rust. And I came to Rust uh, pretty much because I was fed up with using C++, um, really burned out after a long project on Unreal. I wanted to see what the cool kids were talking about. I uh, gave it a go and found out that it really did just gel with the way I think, which to me is one of the most important things in a language. Um, so we've got quite a lot to cover in this talk. Um, I'm going to start off by with a very quick who I am, just so you um, know why you should be listening to me, hopefully. Um, then why Rust for game development, which is gleaned partly from talking to various people who are working in the game development industry. Um, have a look at a few of the current engines that are in development. Uh, they've been coming a really long way in the last year. So when I gave a similar talk about a year ago, um, three out of four of the uh, engine names have changed and most of the content. Um, and we're going to dive into Bevy because it's my current favorite engine to use. And then we're going to change gears a little bit and look at um, how uh, a lot of bigger houses are sticking with the uh, large game engines, you know, the established ones, Godot and Real Unity, but using Rust to uh, assist with some of the difficult bits. And then lastly, I'd like to open up for questions. So uh, like I said, I'm Herbert Wolverson. Um, I'm a software development consultant, uh, primarily with a wireless internet service provider in Missouri, USA. Um, I've been doing indie game development for fun for about 20 years, maybe more than that, but I don't want to admit to much more than that. I'm getting old. Um, over the years, I've used just about everything from C++, C Sharp, PHP, Python, Rust, Perl scripts, um, always been very pragmatic in my approach to languages. I tend to think find a language that suits the problem you're trying to solve and doesn't give you too much of a headache is, you know, honestly, uh, there are some languages that I really don't want to touch again, like Perl 3. Um, and in the last couple of years, uh, I put together the Rust roguelike tutorial. Uh, this actually started out as uh, the <clears throat> second time I tried to write something in Rust. You can kind of tell from the first chapter. Um, 73 chapters later, it's looking pretty good. You've got to the point that there's an almost complete game. I've got two more chapters to go and it'll be published. Um, it takes you from the very beginnings of how do I get an app symbol on the screen moving around all the way up to figuring out the AI of this monster is hungry, how should it find me in the dungeon and eat me for breakfast, getting dragons to fit through doorways, fun stuff like that. Um, because of the Rust roguelike tutorial, I made bracket lib. Now bracket lib is a game engine I would not use for anything you want high performance in. It's deliberately focused on making something um, teachable making something that uh, you can understand how it, how the things put together. And so there's been a lot of cases I've left performance on the table because optimizing it into something really fast is just going to make it confusing. And I'd much rather have something that I can use as a teaching vehicle. And so when I wrote Hands-On Rust, which originally started as uh, my asking, can I make the roguelike tutorial into a printed bug? And the publisher is saying, no, write something a little more general than that. Um, it's, uh, it uses bracket lib, but it's primarily about teaching the Rust language. So it starts from hello world, builds up to making flappy, flappy ASCII, uh, flappy dragon, and um, some more roguelike games. But along the way, it's mostly focused on teaching you the language. And then just as I was finishing hands on Rust, the publisher actually asked me what I'd like to write a second book, uh, Rust Brain Teasers. Um, it went to the printer uh, yesterday. Um, should, so it should be in bookstores in about a month. Um, Rust Brain Teasers is sort of the other end. It's uh, let's look at intermediate questions that Rust users run into, get confused by, and um, then it'll explain to you why it works the way it does. In some cases, it'll grumble a little bit because they're, you know, Rust isn't perfect. But most of the time, it's understand the uh, understand the thought process behind it and see why. Yes, it's a problem, but if you approach from this other direction, it's less of a problem. All right, so why would you want to use Rust in game development? And as Rust is, like most languages, stems from uh, looking at some of the pain points of other languages, figuring out what hurts, and building a language that solves those problems. And the big two that <clears throat> really help in the game world are uh, 
um, memory safety, and concurrency. And so let's dive into that a little bit. First of all, uh, Rust is a systems language, meaning it compiles directly to native code. So you don't have to worry about an intermediate language that then gets recompiled other than the LLVM stuff. And there's no garbage collector, so you don't have the C-sharp problem that uh, they're always that Unity is always adding features to the C-sharp scripting side. And then you know a day later, here's an article on how to do that without the memory management causing stuttering. Uh, Rust doesn't have that problem because Rust compiles down to native code. On the other hand, when you look at C, you start to see uh, a whole lot of pain caused over you know, 30, 40 years of C development because C makes it very, very easy to do exactly what you told it, even if you forgot to check for the boundary conditions and suddenly terrible things happen. And so Rust bakes in a whole lot of safety and makes it very difficult to shoot yourself in the foot and then adds in the unsafe tag which allows you to shoot yourself in the foot, but you have to clearly label where you're going to shoot yourself in the foot so that somebody else can come along, look at your code and say, okay, that was a bad idea. And it's nicely labeled. So anything you can do in C, you can do in Rust, but the parts that might hurt you are clearly labeled. So that's a big win because now you know which part of the code to order the most. And when you're in game devs, a lot of, um, a lot of game dev shops get really low level down to twiddling bits, especially when you're trying to pack a whole game into fitting on one disk for a, a console or a, even a handheld device. And Rust makes that a little easier by giving you some safety rails, but when you compile it with optimizations, some of the safety rails go away, but at least you had them while you were building it. Um, other pain points that I've run into a lot, um, C++ build systems, um, <clears throat> they don't suck, they're just not consistent. It's very easy to have a job in one shop that uses CMake, get a job a couple of years later and discover that they use the uh, GNU build tools. And pretty much nothing that you learned about structuring your project from the first one applies to the second one. So Rust made a big effort to make the cargo tool system easy to use, consistent on every platform you try it on. Cross compilation doesn't hurt or doesn't hurt very often unless you're targeting a Mac. Um, and the package system, is a whole lot easier to use than, uh, um, VC, than VC package, Conan, and all the other C++ equivalents. Um, mostly because uh, it's all in one place and it's going to be the same when you discover that you're now targeting Windows as opposed to the uh, nice Linux setup that you had the previous week. Um, so on top of that, so Rust is great, but nobody with an existing ecosystem is going to be able to throw it all away and immediately switch to Rust. So Rust made a big effort on FFI, the foreign function interface. And it's very easy to write Rust that can be executed from C, C++, C Sharp, Java, and so on. It's also very easy to write uh, Rust that can execute or even build in compilation as part of your build chain. Um, so for example, you might have a killer library that handles collision detection in C++. It's pretty easy to uh, compile that in such a way that Rust can use that library, so you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And a lot of what you're, a lot of what I've been seeing is that Rust is sneaking in. It starts to appear in a small space, and then suddenly more and more of the project until it, you're a Rust shop. And so the two primary features, you know, memory safety we talked about, concurrency is built in. Um, C and C++ both have thread, um, and uh, thread primitives available, but they've been added over the years, and it kind of shows. Um, you can, it's quite easy to get yourself tied up into a knot, wondering whether you should use the Windows thread primitives, pthread, which um, doesn't compile on Windows without a shim library, um, std thread, which is great, but now you can't name your threads, and so on. <clears throat> so Rust built that in right from the beginning, and then the compiler itself can detect when you're doing something inadvertently dumb, like uh, two threads writing to the same variable without a synchronization, and will simply refuse to compile as opposed to uh, leaving you scratching your head wondering why it is that uh, your data isn't um, always consistent depending on you know, which way the wind is blowing and how many cores your user has. You know, I shipped a game once and discovered that uh, it worked fine until you had a customer with 16 cores. Turns out it worked great with the 12 I had tested on. 
and I hadn't even thought that the extra four might change things, but the timing changed enough. That was an old C project. I <clears throat> got it patched in a day, but I really shouldn't have had to. So the Rust compiler helps you out, and often it makes it easy enough that you don't realize that you're using it. So this is from uh, a hands-on Rust example. Um, the hands-on Rust code uses Legion, which is an entity component system. And Legion supports scheduling systems, which are functions that uh, um, it, it, it injects dependencies for accessing the uh, game's data state. Um, it uses the builder pattern to specify what you're going to run every frame. So we specify player input collisions. And then flush tells it, well, uh, now you need to wait for the result of these two before you run something else. And then it runs various run, um, renderers and code that generates uh, random movement instructions that actually use on the next frame. And Legion was smart enough to figure out that uh, input and collision share some data and make them sequential. It does that just by with some beautiful template magic that detects uh, um, access to data stores. But then the map render, the entity render, and the random movement all run concurrently. Now, the first time I ran this was back in the roguelike tutorial. I didn't even realize it was doing that until I looked at my task monitor and noticed that my game had multiple threads. And that, was, that just blew me away. That's the easiest concurrency I've ever seen because I didn't know I had it. Uh, later on, I learned that I could add mutexes, um, state uh, guards, message between threads if needs be, and really take advantage of it. But ultimately, I could use all the cores of my computer without ever intending to do so. And that, that was just amazing to me. All right, so now we're going to take a look at some of the engines that are out there. Now, Firox, uh, which was known as RG3D until about a month ago, um, started out as one fellow's project to make a first person shooter in Rust. And he got a little carried away. He's been having a great time and he's being helped by a whole bunch of other people now. And it's now got a full um, editor, scripting system built in. It can bake light maps, um, store scene graphs, serialize, serialize all your game data for saving the game, play audio with position. And it's got to the point that you can make something like this in about 150 lines of code plus some uh, um, plus a, you know a little bit of a little bit of glue to uh, list the assets. Um, all the assets are taken from other projects. Um, but that's really quite impressive. The uh, he, uh, they're working pretty hard right now on adding in um, support for uh, um, other other types of game. It very much started first person shooter. Uh, they're putting in. Um, things you might need if you wanted to make an RPG. Whoop, there we go. And the editor seriously looks like it fell straight out of uh, um, Unreal or Unity. Um, it's got a full uh, per level um, scene graph, uh, bakes in collisions. Um, it looks like a <clears throat> very professional project. I highly recommend checking out Firox um, if you want to do anything in the 3D domain with Pretty graphics. It's coming along a long. It's coming along fast. Uh, seems like they're committing to it every day. Um, performance is great. The uh, there's a slight stall right now because uh, one of the fellows who develops Egui is in uh, Ukraine, unfortunately. But um, so hopefully that'll work out for him. All right, going all the way to the other end of the spectrum is MacroQuad. MacroQuad started out as how small an engine can I possibly make and still have it useful? Um, so it focuses on being very, very high performance. And uh, the first version, all it could do was draw squares. And it could draw textured squares, colored squares. It didn't really matter, it was going to be a square. And it's the name MacroQuad. Um, it focuses very hard on being simple. And the because of that, it's a good one if you want to just start learning. Um, a game called Fish Fight just released and is actually built entirely on MacroQuad plus some sound code. Um, it's uh, quite a fun platform game. Uh, when you look at their source code, it's all open source. They had to implement some of the physics themselves. A little bit is in MacroQuad, but very little. And pretty much everything else um, is just using MacroQuad to play sounds and very quickly draw their beautiful pixel art onto the screen. And moving all the way to the crazy end of the spectrum, there's Kajia. Um, Embark Studios 
um, set out to see what you could do with Rust. Uh, we're a little surprised to discover that the new NVIDIA RTX standard hadn't been uh, fully supported yet. So they went ahead and supported that, open sourced it, and built an entire 3D engine with uh, ray tracing, global illumination as the focus. Um, they haven't released all of their tools yet. Apparently they're coming. But this is one to watch for the future. Um, it can produce some really beautiful graphics very quickly. Um, but like I said, it's going to be a little while before this one's in sufficiently good shape to do more than run the demo and uh, wish you had a nicer laptop. All right, um, Bevy. Bevy is probably my favorite engine right now. Um, years ago, uh, the Amethyst engine was the one that everybody was saying, this is where engines on Rust are going to go. It ran into some uh, technical and political issues. And Bevy was born. Um, Bevy is focused very heavily on being an entity, entity component system, um, pretty much parallelize, parallelize everything for you, um, built-in message passing. It's rapidly become kind of a kitchen sink engine in the sense that uh, if you want a feature, there's probably a plugin for it. On the other hand, uh, Carter, the guy who runs it, has been maintaining something of an iron fist in terms of keeping uh, the engine itself um, nice, nice and lean, and all of the uh, fluff and plugins. So I support, I you know, I support that view because uh, the engine is still small enough that I can understand it. Um, it is number four on GitHub's open source game engine category, so it's been gaining a lot of traction um, from using it. Its two D support is fantastic. Its three D support um, will be fantastic, but isn't there yet. Um, in the last release, they accidentally broke uh, using specifying additional data for each point in the 3D render. And that unfortunately broke so many other things that I just say, don't, do, don't try 3D for another month or two. Um, and currently it's code first. They're hoping to have an editor Unity style, but that's not there yet. So how easy is it to work with? Uh, the little game you see running there is 198 lines of code, including comments, and there's quite a few comments. I'll uh, send you guys a link to a Medium article showing you how to put this together. Um, it took me about two and a half hours, and I'd never fired up Bevy before in my life to turn this into a running project that has your basic velocity of a sp um, your spaceship moving left and right, um, tracking um, your laser blasts flying upwards and shooting the aliens. Um, for that particular test, I didn't have the aliens shooting back. When I added that, it took it to about 250 lines of code. Um, overall, though, my experience was that it was very, very smooth sailing. So what can you do with 300 lines of code? Now, this was something I knocked together yesterday afternoon. Um, load a 3D model of a helicopter, a randomly generated landscape, and fly around and apply a little bit of velocity. Um, this uh, will be on GitHub because I only wrote it yesterday. I haven't got around to pushing it yet. Um, it's not really a full game in the sense that currently you can't crash and you don't have an objective. But I was pretty impressed by the fact that I was able to get a full 3D system with shading going in 300 lines of code. Looks pretty nice. And of that 300 lines of code, honestly, a quarter of it could probably be, be be macroed out because it's uh, quite repetitive for uh, spawn this here, spawn that there, and you wind up repeating yourself a little bit. So overall, right now, Bevy is my favorite of the Rust game engines. Um, I am actually in the process of writing a third book that will be partly about Bevy, so I'm also biased. And <clears throat> let's see, now we're moving on to scripting. This is uh, probably the of the most common way I'm seeing larger development shops using Rust now. Um, Godot in particular has excellent support for Rust. Um, there's a package called Godot Rust that uh, integrates the entire um, Godot scripting language into Rust, allows you to write your Godot scripts in Rust, compile them, and have them execute natively in your Godot program. Um, now, for some simple things, you probably wouldn't want to do that because Rust, <clears throat> your Rust is an amazing language, but it's not always the, most, the uh, quickest to type. Um, 
so if your script is something very simple, like uh, clicked here, I just want to play a little beep sound, well, you might as well use the native script. If your script is something complicated, like the top left example there is a factory planning program similar to Factorium. Um, it's calculating interactions from neighboring factory elements um, every frame. Uh, Godot script was just too slow, so Rust was fantastic for calculating that. Um, all of the games that you see pictured there are using uh, Rust's, Rust as a scripting engine. The annotation system is beautiful and that you can write a function in Rust, add an annotation to it that says Godot colon function. And when you recompile, the Godot editor will see that function is now being available for you to include into your uh, Godot scene graph. So that is uh, probably the best Rust integration with it engine that I've seen so far. Now going to the worst, um, Unreal. Um, now Unreal Engine, because it's very much C++ based, you probably don't really need Rust. You may wish you had it because uh, the Unreal memory management can give you some severe headaches and migraines. Um, but Unreal's C++ and Rust just aren't a good fit. Um, Unreal is massively based on inheritance. So when you want to create your own actor, you inherit from actor. Now Rust doesn't do that. Rust goes with traits, but doesn't have deep object hierarchies. And so the uh, Unreal integration code I've seen tends to be very shallow for, um, tends not to be game logic. It tends to be more things like I needed a secure way to talk to my server and exchange high scores, or I needed a secure way to handle login. So using Rust strengths, the security side of things, but not so much the game integration because you wind up writing uh, your code in Rust, <clears throat> then you end up writing a C++ wrapper that calls your code from Rust, and then you go into the Unreal editor and half the time you wind up calling, having a blueprint that calls into the C++ that calls into the Rust and then back and then back and giving yourself a development headache. So if you're in the Unreal space, I would say that Rust is probably not gonna be the greatest idea yet. Um, although I have heard that there are projects to make this a little less painful. Now, over in Unity, I've been seeing more and more Rust. Um, Rust's FFI exports are very easy to combine with C Sharp's uh, P Invoke, um, which in turn, Unity has a plugin called Native, designed for allowing you to call any code that you've compiled for your system. Uh, various libraries have made it easy to uh, export. So up at the top here, you, it says you know, um, no mangle. So don't change the function name. Um, extern function, get a random integer, generates a random number. And then there's a C sharp class there that connects to it. And that's all you'd need to have your random number generator run in Rust. And if you're wondering why you might want to do that, uh, the Rust uh, rand create is about 100 times faster than the uh, default one in C sharp. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are other, other ways to do that. Where I've been seeing this the most is when you're doing some really heavy lifting that, um, for example, you want to uh, completely dynamically create a huge mesh. Um, well, it's really nice to be able to do that in Rust where you have fine-tuned control and can be sure that the garbage collector is not going to suddenly decide to kick in to get rid of the thousand vertices you um, just stopped working on and let you dispose of it nicely at the end. Um, or if, for example, you're writing a game with uh, voxel deformation, well, you can nicely represent that in, um, in Rust, and Rust can do the heavy lifting very fast and taking advantage of all your cores if needs be, whereas Unity can just call into it. So Unity becomes the graphics engine, the wrapper, making sure that you get a very friendly interface to the player, and Rust can take the bits that uh, Unity would struggle with in terms of performance and Give you a much, but you don't sacrifice some of the safety that you lose when you go to C++ uh, because Rust generally won't let you shoot yourself in the foot. And lastly, I'm seeing a lot of uh, um, game developers. Uh, I was talking to a fellow from Blizzard I probably shouldn't name, um, and they're using Rust heavily for making tools. They're not actually uh, using it in the primary in any uh, customer-facing primary games right now but Rust is um, a mainstay of the tooling behind things. And I'm seeing that in business outside of games too. Like 
when you fire up an Amazon Web Services um, host, you're actually talking to a whole bunch of Rust systems that sit in the middleware and take care of orchestrating things and making them run, even though the front end isn't in Rust and the VM isn't in Rust. Rust is really good at uh, putting itself in the middle, being the glue. So if you need to make a quick tool for uh, transforming some data from one thing to another, Rust is often a good choice, especially if there's a lot of data because it goes fast. Um, if you need to worry about security aspects, um, and you're probably already using it without knowing it because a lot of distributions have switched from using the GNU TLS encryption layer to Rust TLS just because it turned out to be faster and safer. Um, and I've in, uh, also talked to a few people who are using it as the backbone for uh, um, serializing data, squirting them between systems from multiplayer games, and then having that be largely independent of the actual game itself. Rust just is really good at network integration. All right, so if you're anything like me, you'll probably think of any questions about 10 minutes after I disconnect. If that's the case, you can get to me um, on Twitter as Hiberticus or the bracket on Reddit. Um, I think my publisher obliges me to ask you to check out my books, Hands on Rust and Rust Brain Teasers. Um, I greatly enjoyed writing them. And so I'm, I love it when people, um, when people uh, read what I've created because it makes it all worthwhile. And also, I am very active on medium.com on my publisher's feed. Uh, so um, keep an eye out there. Uh, if you on um, Twitter, I post, I post every time uh, an article goes up. Um, my writing speed has gone down a little bit because I have a two-month baby right now. Um, and OK, if anybody has any questions. Uh, so first off, thanks for, very much for that. That was great. Um, I actually didn't realize you'd written the uh, roguelike tutorial either, and that's something that I kind of dip, dip, dip into every so often. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that as well. Um, I suppose what I wanted to ask is, um, so Rust is really good for, say, the, the core, the compute, the CPU stuff. Um, do you think do you think we're we're getting there in terms of kind of um, a GPU solution, a GPU access, the, the Nvidia and AMD stuff? Well, the uh, WGPU crate is making amazing headway in terms of um, giving you um, really high performance access to Vulkan and Metal, and those two are close enough. Uh, actually, on DirectX twelve, and those three are similar enough that uh, you can pretty much cross compile your shad shaders between them. Um, and that's actually how the uh, Embark Studios people added in the RTX shader support, um, was they just uh, took the Vulkan extensions and basically turned them on in WGPU, which um, what I'm hoping for is something a little higher level. But I think they've got the base to the point that the base is really good now. Um, but you do write a lot of tedious repetitive code because I don't know if you have ever seen Vulkan on other platforms, but uh, nothing is left to the imagination. You have to specify uh, each, how each and every bit will flow through the GPU pipeline. And so G WGPU mirrors that almost exactly, but it's, all, it's mirroring almost exactly how it works. You can do um, compute, um, compute shaders with it very well. What it we don't have yet is the ability to do a CUDA style compile Rust straight onto the GPU, but I have I know of at least a couple of projects that are trying to make that happen, um, and I think they're they've been waiting on WGPU to figure out some of the GPU communication protocol. Now that's working, I expect that that's going to probably be a big feature of next year. Nice one. So uh, kind of. Um strongly in progress uh Very much so. like the we've we definitely have the foundation it's just um yeah those higher level level primitives and and some of the more specific stuff yep and uh memory fences believe it or not took almost six months to uh uh get that working because the internals of an nvidia card are so different from the internal to the pc it's not even funny <laughs> Yeah, like uh, I believe it. Like uh, I've seen some cooler code. It's uh, yeah, 
Um, yeah, warps is an appropriate term. It does kind of warp my brain. Um, so I suppose um, uh, there was one, one other thing I was wondering about. So um, Bevy is kind of a, an ECS, right? Or th that's, a, that's a lot of what it's providing. Um, how does it compare to, EA, to ECS systems in um, C++, like uh, in terms of ergonomics? Um, well, the uh, um, ENTT entity uh, for C++ is probably the nicest of the C++ ones I've used. Um, and Legion, um, Legion was created a few years back as kind of entity for uh, Rust, and Bevy took uh, Legion and decided to try and make it friendly. Um, it's actually extremely easy to get going. Uh, you can make Hello World in 10 lines of code. Um, the systems um, all handle are all dependency injected, so you write it, um, put a query on the inputs to your function. Uh, the scheduler will then figure out um, any collisions, figure out how to schedule you. Um, and really, they, whenever somebody runs into something that's more difficult than it should be, so far, they've fixed it very fast. Um, so I think by the time it gets to 1.0, it's going to be absolutely, absolutely stellar. Nice one. Yeah, that's a, that's exciting because um yeah, like it it's a it's a big deal to have something that's really core to a game like that that in uh in Ross. Like I think there are a few different projects racing for uh for the kind of uh, the top hit game at the spot right now, which is uh it's exciting to see a few Ross competitors in there. Uh, thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I have a small question, if you don't mind, Herbert. Um, relating to Bevy as well, uh, what are some of the main plugins that you use actually that you find are very useful? Because <laughs> I'm looking at Bevy myself and I see there's lots of plugins and because they're all external, it's sometimes hard to know which are good ones to look out for. Um, I wish I could remember its name, but one of the audio plugins begins with a K. I wish I, I'm just going to blank on the name. I'll message it to you. But the built in Bevy audio is, um, it works, but it's very primitive. If you want any sort of positional audio um, or even something as simple as control between, cr you know, cross fading between two background songs, then Kira, Kira audio is, the one, is what you need. Um, I'm also deaf as a post, so I don't write a whole lot of audio code. Um, I usually find somebody to help me for that part. Um, in the graphics world, there is one called Canvas that I was relying on, and they it was I just they discovered that everybody was relying on it, and it's now part of Bevy, and that's kind of been the pattern I've seen. I was using a plugin for um, PBR materials in 3D. And all of a sudden, that was part of Bevy too. So most of the time, if I use a plugin enough, it seems like they build it in. I'm really hoping they'll build in one of the tile map plugins soon, because uh, um, almost everything's a tile map if you think about it hard enough. And <clears throat> even things like scrolling backgrounds work really well as tile maps. Um, so I'm really hoping that you know maybe maybe one of them will listen to this and uh, um, plug it in for me, but. There's like three or four different time map plugins right now. And if you ask me which one's best, I would tell you that um, they're all 99% of the way there. And every one of them seems to be missing 1% that's present in another one. And if I ever get time, I'll fix that. But hopefully, they'll fix that in the meantime. OK, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't know, Herbert, how much time you have to take more questions, but um, anyone has anything else they would like to ask? Okay. So um, this one's kind of weird and specific, so feel free to dock this one. But um, you mentioned Amethyst ran into some problems, but I think it was parallelization. Um, do you know what the, 
was that like a rust issue? Did they do something wrong in the way they'd set it up? Um, or, or is that kind of a mystery right now? Uh, Amethyst started out using specs, which is the same one I use on the Rust, the same ECS I use on the Rust roguelike tutorial. Um, they knew they wanted to update the backend, and it turned into a bit of a bun fight over which backend to go with. They went with Legion, and um, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> found that Legion and specs were different enough that they ran into all, all manner of internal troubles. And then as online communities want to do, they started splitting into factions that one group wanted Amethyst next, one group wanted Amethyst traditional, uh, one group wanted to use something else completely, and a whole bunch of them ended up just going over to Bevy. Um, we have a I'll question actually... in the chat as well there um, from Aaron. Um... Uh, let's see. Um, what do I think about using Rust as a game server for a multiplayer online game? Um, I think that's a tremendous idea. Um, between something like Tokyo to give you a high performance asynchronous networking backend, and one of the uh, one of the higher performance serialization systems, like um, like one of the message pack systems rather than CERD, which <clears throat> you know CERD is fantastic, but fast isn't isn't its forte. Um, you really could be a long way there quite quickly. Um, the uh, hard part then, of course, becomes you've got these messages coming in. You need to uh, synchronize the game state. Um, well, the good news is that uh, you know Bevy um, and Legion both include um, serializing, serializing um, entity component changes specifically, so that you can squirt them over the network and pull them back in. Um, then you've got all the usual pain points of multiplayer games of determining you know, who's authoritative. If you've got a server, that, that helps. Otherwise, you can have fun with uh, you know, player one's um, computer thinks that you're over there, and player two's computer thinks that you're on Mars. And so player three sees you hovering in between the two. Um, Rust can't help with that, but honestly, that's a programming issue you're going to run into in Rust, Golang, or anything else. But Rust uh, is very ergonomic for making network servers. That's something I do in the office quite often. Great. Thanks for the answer. I hope that answers your question, Aaron. Yeah, so, um, great. <laughs> um, it's been great uh, talk, Herbert. Thanks for... Uh, answering all of our questions and giving us a great talk it's thanks thanks for being here first of all because um yeah we're quite a small group so far we've just started so it's great to have someone like yourself uh show up and give a talk and um yeah as we grow um yeah it's 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 uh it's great <laughs> and thank you for having me i, I love doing this now, so fantastic all right, um, if there's no more questions, then I will, um, I guess we can call this the end of the official talk, but of course people are free to 